Lee Timchenko, and I'm a master's in public policy candidate here at the Heidel Kennedy School, the Bedford Young Leader Student Fellow, and chair of the Ukraine Caucus here at HKS. I'd like to welcome both our in person and virtual guests. For those of you in Zoom, feel free to type the questions in the QA box. Also, be aware that this session is being recorded, though your image may appear in the recording, but we may post this video to the Bedford Center's website. While this event is on the record, the event organizers prohibit any attendees, including journalists, and audio visual recording or distributing parts or on the event program without prior written uh, authorization. Once again, welcome to such an important event to the Kennedy, uh, at the uh, Kennedy School. Today, we have the unique opportunity to hear from a voice that has long been suppressed, a voice that has been popular until a year ago. I'll be hearing a message from Ukraine. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, since the from Western academia tended to, but in some ways, in the broad Eastern European region, as foreign policy priorities shifted elsewhere, and as the Kremlin was seen as sort of defeated. This had considerable damage on misunderstanding the region. Those academic programs on Eastern Europe that remained tended to give into a Russia centric perspective, as Russia was still seen as a hegemony of extended sphere of influence. This made attempting for Russia to extend this narrative of influence with top global schools becoming prime attractive hubs for Russia to try to extend that influence. And the patterns of school programs can be exemplary of the Russian centralism in ac academia. Just look at names of Eastern European programs and many Ivy League schools which dominate the world with the word Russia. But one will go what Ukraine proved to many Western experts that their understanding of the region was fraud. Ukraine started to align the narrative with truth and destroy the Kremlin's narrative based on lies. Thanks to the unbankable determination of Ukrainians, I'm able to present you today's guest. It's my pleasure to welcome the former so Ukraine, Dreko Leba, to the Harvard Kennedy School. When Dreko was born in 1981 in Sumy, a city located in northeastern uh, Ukraine. In 2003, Dreko Leba graduated with honor from the Institute of International Relations at University, where he studied international law. In 2006, Mr. Koleba obtained a PhD in law. His experience in diplomacy dates back to 2003, as he started his career at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Since then, he has held multiple diplomacy positions, including being the master at large, permanent representative of Ukraine to the Council of Europe, and deputy prime minister for European and Euro Atlantic integration of Ukraine. Mr. Koreba has been Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine since March 2020. He's also the author of a book called The Law of Reality, How to Win in the Win of the Fakes, Truths, and Communities. Good University, please welcome Ukraine's Foreign Minister Mudra Tlena. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm grateful for the invitation. It's really an honor to address you today. I wish I could be present in person as I sincerely wanted to personally experience the greatness of your university and directly pass on to you the thoughts and feelings of the great people of Ukraine. But the UN is to blame for my online appearance. <laughs> Apparently, it's always easy to blame international institutions. That's the rule in diplomacy, and I'm using it. But jokes aside, yes. I had to stay in New York to address the ANGA and hold additional bilaterals to persuade some members, member states, especially from the Global South, to support the upcoming UN General Assembly resolution on Ukraine. And now let me begin by taking you back straight in 1991. August 1st, 1991. President of the United States, George W. Bush, visits Kiev and delivers the famous Chicken Kiev speech in the Ukrainian parliament. He had just met Gorbachev in Moscow. Now he is in Kiev, cautioning against what he called, I quote, suicidal nationalism. He told tens of millions of Ukrainians who wanted their own country to give up their dreams and stay with Moscow. In just three weeks, tanks will enter central Moscow. The Soviet Union starts to collapse, leading to Ukraine proclaiming independence. Fast forward four months 
in December 1991, the USSR legally ceases to exist. Russian leader Boris Yeltsin sends a letter to the UN Secretary General. He is claiming Russia's right to the Soviet seat on the UN Security Council. Note a single legal procedure defined by the UN Charter is upheld. A simple letter, legally null, null and void, becomes the reason for the UN Secretariat to change nameplates at the tables. This is how big world politics is done. And Russia usurps the seat with the silent consent of other members. And now fast forward three years, Budapest, December 1994. Russia and the United States join forces to denuclearize Ukraine. In exchange for abandoning its numerous nukes, Ukraine receives security assurances. The most significant of which is the commitment to convene UN Security Council consultations in case of the threat of nuclear attack. Russia, the US and the UK also pledge to ensure there will be no use of force or threat of use of force against Ukraine. Nukes in return for consultations and promises. That's what it was. And these were three strategic mistakes. From 1991 to 1994, this chain of mistakes set the stage for the war I just came from. Instead of cementing Ukraine's place in the West, our state was disarmed and abandoned in the gray zone to see what would come out of it. The Cold War was over, but Ukraine was left outside in the cold. We were not left alone, though. Ukraine was held at a distance of a firm, friendly handshake, but always at a distance. The strategic failure to start Ukraine's accession to NATO at the 2008 Bucharest summit has become just the first level of this house built upon all previous mistakes. While the West exercised short-sighted cautiousness, Russia was growingly persistent and self-assured. Unlike the West, it always had a Ukraine strategy. Think of this. There hasn't been a decade in which Russia hasn't threatened Ukraine's territorial integrity. Attempts to seize Crimea in 1993. The Tuzla crisis. Tuzla is a small, tiny island between Crimea and the Russian territory in the Sea of Azov. It was in 2003. The occupation of Crimea in 2014. The war in the east of Ukraine in 2014 and the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022. There has not been a single decade when Russia would not betray willingness of its Western partners to be friends with it and pardon it for its sins. For years, Europe had, Europe had been confident enough to say it could sort things out without America. But this war has proven the opposite whether you like it or not, but the United States continue to bear responsibility for maintaining European peace since 1945. Speaking in Brussels recently, President Zelensky said, we are defending not only your values, but your interests, end of quote. And these words are no less significant than the ones he said about ammunition and the right. They explain why Ukraine should be supported. But what about Ukraine? I have to be frank. We have made our mistakes too, like you did. We bred a class of oligarchs in the early 90s. We did not pay enough of attention to our army. Our foreign policy strategy zigzagged from time to time. We engaged Russia in our domestic politics from time to time. And we allow some cor corruption schemes to blossom. But whatever flaws we had, one thing has always made us fundamentally different from Russia. The core of the Ukrainian project has always been freedom. Whereas the core of the Russian project has always been obedience. Obedience of Russian nationals towards Tsar, 
and the imposed obedience of neighbors towards Russia. And here is the key. Freedom is what makes Ukraine part of the West. But there is also something else that has always united us. I would call it a lack of self-confidence self towards Russia. For decades, neither you nor us, we have had confidence that we can prevail over Russia and discipline it. And that is why the conclusion has always been that we need to make concessions. Russian imperialism has been overlooked for decades and has been tolerated for decades. But look at Moldova in 1992, look at Chechnya, look at Georgia, look at Ukraine. Russia was continuously invited to the table, pleased, appeased, and pardoned. Its imperial influence has spread easily through academia, media, culture, politics, sports, and business in the West. And this is how we got to the Bucharest 2008 mistake when Ukraine was not given the membership action plan to become uh, a member of NATO. This is, all of this took us to the attempted illegal annexation of Crimea, the interference in the 2016 U.S. elections, and other troubles and tragedies. I remember clearly the moment when I began to believe in Ukraine without a second thought. And I have to confess it was only in early hours, of February 25th, 2022. This was the day when I left this lack of self-confidence behind and began to believe that we can prevail and we will. On that night, I was driving from Poland into my dark and war-ravaged homeland. My car was the only one driving in with hundreds of cars driving out. That was the moment when I personally abandoned fear. Yes, I was afraid of many things at that moment, but I overcame my fear and I told myself, we are going to win. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to, to be sitting in a car and driving in and not out of Ukraine. I also know when we abandoned fear as a nation, when we restored our self-confidence, it happened after one week of resistance because this was the maximum which even our closest friends gave us. You know, as foreign minister, I always fight for a change of perspective. And abandoning fear is part of that concept. I keep saying, stop looking at Ukraine through the prism of Russia. I keep saying, do not assume that peace is only achievable through Ukraine's concessions. Don't say that Russia shouldn't win. Set a positive goal instead. Ukraine must win. Don't be afraid to arm Ukraine with whatever weapons it requires. At the end of the day, don't be scared of Russia's collapse or the future without this Russia, Russia as we know it now. It takes this slight shift of perspective to start making correct policy decisions. In my tenures, tenure as foreign minister, I have realized that it's not about asking someone to take certain decisions, but rather asking to change the perspective so that certain decisions become possible. Now, what will a Ukrainian victory look like? It's Ukraine restoring territorial integrity within internationally recognized borders. Why are those who advocate for the cessation of weapons deliveries to Ukraine are hypocrites? Because what they really want is not peace, but Russian victory and the genocide of Ukrainians. What is the answer to the question, how long will this war last? The right answer is, don't ask how long this war will last. Ask what you can do to bring Ukraine's victory closer. Why does it make no sense to fear escalation? Because the West had experience, has experience of managing uh, Russia. It's not the most uh, successful one for, on a number of accounts. But the, here is one thing. Look at the last speech by President Putin. 
there were so many fears and expectations associated to, with, with it. But in the end, we all saw that his corridor for escalation is getting narrower. There is no space for uh, Russia. And moreover, look back and let's recognize that Russia need, never needed anyone else's decision or move to escalate in response. Russia was always escalating itself and then was accusing others of provoking it. That's the classic tactics. There was not a single instance when fears of escalation materialized. I remember how we were fighting for uh, unlocking new options, new weapons options. And every time when we asked for artillery, the response was, if we give you artillery, Russia will escalate. You gave us artillery, Russia did not escalate. Ever, ever since, be it HIMARS, being long-range missiles, be, be it uh, air defense or uh, tanks, it all started with, no, we're not going to do it because Russia will escalate. But Russia had always escalated before you made a decision to provide us with any weapons. The most interesting question is what to do with Russia. And to my, in my uh, view, the answer is change it so that it no longer poses a threat to anyone. I know it may sound too provocative, but we have to understand as long as Russia remains as it is, it will remain a source of threat. We can win the war. We can expel Russia from our territory and we will do so. But if Russia remains as it is, it will continue to be a source of threat. And one more point, this is not a war for compromise. This is a war for Ukraine's victory. And I'm saying it as a diplomat because Ukraine's victory is in everyone's interest. We cannot allow Russia to get away with what it has done and get even more emboldened. This will also embolden the world's other evil forces. It is far less expensive to support Ukraine now and allow us to defeat this evil than to face it later. Only on the battlefield can a just and lasting peace be achieved in this war. In such a case, the goal of our wartime diplomacy is to help achieve this result with supplies of weapons, new sanctions, financial support, and of course, building strong coalitions. Things are different today. We are almost done breaking the cycle and making sure that the Russian imperial project will fail. A Ukrainian victory, as I already said, is essential to this end. As history teaches us, Ukrainian independence and Russian imperialism are irreconcilable, just as freedom and obedience are irreconcilable. We are far better off today than we were during all previous attempts to break free and bring down the empire. Nowadays, we are winning in an information war, unlike in 2014. We have one of the strongest armies in Europe with your support. This is different from the beginning of the 20th century when we failed to defend our independence against Russia. We have President Zelensky, an inspirational wartime leader who has become the hero of our time and galvanized global attention. Today, our core idea of freedom is universally shared Unlike in the 17th and early 20th century, centuries when we had fought against Russia, fighting for our independence. Most importantly, we now have the first generation of Ukrainians in their 30s who have not lived in the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, I do not belong to it. I'm much older. But they are already part of the resistance on many levels, holding important posts and leading small units on the front line. For them, Ukraine has never gained independence, like for me. It has always been independent. For them, the world without you independent Ukraine doesn't exist. Modern Ukraine is not only a state, it's a project in the making. And I think this is what makes us very similar to the United States. 
the Ukraine we want to be is always ahead of us. We are essentially a collaboration of people of all ages, all walks of life, all ethnic backgrounds, and all faith united in our determination to make Ukraine a success and put an end to Russia's imperial frenzy. We as a generation are determined to prove that this time we will not only struggle, but actually win. And, um, you know, last year, a few weeks before the full-scale invasion began, the Secretary of State, an exemplary diplomat and my friend, and I'm proud to be his friend, Anthony Blinken, visited Kiev. And I invited him to my office. We sat down for a talk, just two of us. And I told him, Tony, I know we may face some dreadful challenges soon. But one thing I am confident about is that I will not be writing my memoirs in exile, as many Ukrainian politicians of the past did. I will be writing my memoirs in Kiev as a representative of the generation that won the most important war in the most important war of their lifetime. I don't know whether he had full confidence in what I was saying, but he has been always there to support us and to help me since then. And one year later, I'm talking with you, representing the country that is alive and kicking against all odds. And so be it. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I really appreciate this opportunity um, to have to, to, to speak to you. And if my assistant's, assistant scrolls down the text in front of me, I may share with you main takeaways of my lecture. <laughs> Great. Let me recap five takeaways. First, forces of history need to be followed, not opposed. Second, short-sighted cautiousness yields opposite results. Third, evil must be defeated, not pardoned or appeased. Fourth, it takes a change of perspective to change policy. And this is really the most important rule for me, the most, my personal biggest takeaway in my career. And fifth, to win, we have to abandon fear and believe in our joint cause. And now, here comes my final thank you. <laughs> That's it. In oh, case. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, Minister Kaleba, my name is Eric Rosenbach. I'm the co director of the Belfer Center here. Used to have uh, positions in the Pentagon, Assistant Secretary of Defense, and uh, chief of staff at the Pentagon as well, used to meet with senior Ukrainian officials on a regular basis. Um, thank you so much for making time to meet with us. Uh, it's a little sad that you couldn't be here in person. You seem like you'd fit right in on the Harvard faculty. We need to get you in the classroom here sometime soon. And thank you also for everything that you're doing. Pretty amazing run that you've had just this week being in Kyiv in Warsaw, I think, in Brussels, in New York, all around the world. You probably only slept about two or three hours a day and you're fighting the war. Thank you for everything you do. It's inspirational. Um, we're going to ask a couple questions first, myself and my colleague I'll introduce, uh, and then we'll go to the students who I'm sure will have the best questions. But I'd like to introduce Ambassador Paula Dobriansky. Uh, she is also, like you, a PhD from Harvard University. She served in some of the most senior positions in the government, including as the Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs, which essentially is the number three position in the Department of State. Um, so she has been around, seen a lot, and most importantly, she's Ukrainian. So we're very happy about that as well. Paula, thank you so much. She's also a senior fellow at the Belfer Center. And I'm gonna turn it over to you for the first question. Right, well, thank, thank you so much, Eric. And welcome to you, uh, Minister Kaleba. Very good to see you. We would have loved to see you here in person, but it's good to see you in any event. And let me also just congratulate you on the very powerful opening statement that you made. 
uh, not only did you make a, a very clear, concise, poignant, and compelling statement, but you also answered, I'm going to say, almost 95% of the questions that are always answered and it's uh, always addressed. And it was good to hear your responses. As Eric indicated, you've been hitting the ground. And particularly the past week, you've had a lot of meetings. And I believe that when you were, uh, I believe in Munich, that you met with NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg and also the EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Josep Burrell. And this was the first high-level Ukraine-EU-NATO talks. Can you share with us your perspective of what took place uh, uh, as a result of those talks, given Ukraine's own strong desire to be part of the EU? Thank you, Paul. It's good, to, it's good seeing you again. Um, yeah, the meeting that we, that we had, um, it may sound weird, but it was the first time that all three of us, Ukraine, NATO, and EU, got together at senior level to actually coordinate and uh, ensure that there will be no duplication of efforts and slowdowns in resolving numerous issues, in particular related to the uh, production, procurement of weapons and ammunition for Ukraine, and most importantly, deliveries. You have to keep one thing in mind, uh, what Ukraine and its partners are doing now in terms of deliver uh, security assistance deliveries to Ukraine represents the largest logistical operation since World War II. It's it's easy it's easy when we read book history books and someone and someone write uh, a, a respected scholar writes that this was the biggest something. But it's much more difficult to recognize this biggest something when you are in the middle of it and you are living through it. And this is exactly what's happening. Um, the meeting went extremely well. And I even began to regret that uh, when Ukraine becomes a member of the EU and NATO, we won't be able to sit down in the same format anymore. So in this format, we'll cease, <laughs> to, we'll cease to exist. Uh, but basically, yes, the war is awful. War is hell. War is terrible. But uh, um, while it does bring death and slow, slows down many important vital processes uh, in politics and life, it also galvanizes and speeds up many things. And uh, this uh, rapprochement between Ukraine and uh, NATO and EU, it should have happened years ago, but the, there was always a lack of political will, mostly on the side of both, both alliances or institutions to make it happen. Now it is there, more visible and recognized at the level of the European Union, as we were granted the candidate status finally, uh, less, uh, pub less visible in NATO because while we enjoy enormous support for, of allies themselves, the NATO is not eloquent. NATO as an alliance is not eloquent on the even estimated timeline of Ukraine's, Ukraine's accession. But it's going to happen. I must tell you that uh, I'm not, I'm not, I do not think that uh, integration into EU and NATO remain the biggest problems of Ukrainian foreign policy because they are, this is going to happen. Uh, there is no way back. Wheels of history are turning. It's just a matter of time. And the sooner it happens, the better it will be for all of us. Thank you, Minister Kaleba. Eric? Uh, Minister Kaleba, thank you again for making time for us. Um, as you mentioned, you know, war is hell. And right now on the Eastern front of Ukraine, there are thousands of people dying every day, both soldiers, civilians on both sides, Russians and lots of Ukrainians, which is a terrible thing. If we look at the one year anniversary, it's really inspiring how well everything has gone for Ukraine. It's inspiring that President Biden was there to visit. Um, but, you know, when you think about the future and the timeline of it, it starts to have an impact on your strategy for war. And so my question is, over the next few months, 
Is there anything that the United States could provide to Ukraine from a capabilities perspective that could bring Russia to the negotiations table? And in particular, if you looked at MiG-29s or long-range missile systems like ATACMS, maybe additional air defense, could that actually save lives on the Eastern Front and bring the Russians to the negotiating table? And is that something that you asked President Biden for when he was there in Kyiv? A short answer to your question and all the sub-questions is yes. <laughs> okay. Can I ask you a follow-up question? Why didn't, why, didn't, um, why didn't President Biden say yes to those capabilities? If we know it's going to save lives, it'll bring the Russians to the table. Why doesn't President Biden in the United States just say yes to the capabilities that would bring a war to the close or at least to the, a peace conference? I think, I think the United States and President Biden himself, they have done enormously a lot. And on all of these positions that you mentioned, the only unlocked option is the only outstanding unlocked option. No, sorry. The only outstanding locked option is the planes. On everything else, the United States are there one way or another. When I have time, uh, and when time passes so no one gets offended, of course, I will write a full story about how weapons, about how decisions on weapons were take, had been taken. Uh, uh, but it's not difficult, it's not easy. It's not easy to get, um, you know, to, to make decisions on some of the most sophisticated weapons. Trust has to be built. And the moment trust between Ukrainian army and politicians on the one side and American army and politicians on the other side was built, the sophisticated arms were deployed to Ukraine. And every type of weapon that you gave us in many cases together with with partners, but you were always leading the effort. They were game changers. In the beginning of the war, I, I, I remember it very vividly. We, we thought that to win the war, we didn't expect it would last so long, to be honest, but we understood that to win the war, we need seven types of new weapons. And uh, this is the big seven, I call it. Uh, and in 12 months, we got six out of seven with only planes remaining. Yes, we can discuss about quantities, about pace of deliveries, but planes is the only outstanding option. And I understand Western politicians. For them, and it's not only the U.S., for them, planes is virtually the last card, you know, to use, the last argument. But I have no doubts that this option will be also unlocked. Again, it's not because... I have a crystal ball that tells me the truth but because I, I, I understand the dynamics of, of the war and the dynamics of the decision making. And let me get back to my introductory remarks. You, I spoke about this perspective. You know, sometimes here is another kind of lesson that I learned throughout my career. Sometimes when you talk with someone who can be helpful, it makes sense not to ask for anything in the conversation itself, but to hold conversation in a, in a manner when that someone will himself dis make a decision. And I think this is the top art of diplomacy, to get something that you need without asking for it. And I'm have reasons to believe that it will be the case. I, uh, there is one more thing that I want, that I want to say on, on this. Of course, as I said, it's easy to read about historic events in, tech, in history books. It's much more difficult to be part of historic events and to live through them and to assess the situation uh, and, and in, a with a, in a perspective and to bear responsibility for decisions you are making. And it's not easy, neither for us nor for uh, your administration. But there are two key elements, that do two key driving forces. 
It's the people of Ukraine in Ukraine and the people of America in America. As long as both sides, both, both peoples will remain committed to the ideals they stand for, politicians will be making decisions. Minister, if, if, if I may, um, I have another question and so does Eric. And we're going to also ask, there are quite a few students, others who are gathered here, uh, to have them uh, line up a bit over here, because we're going to have you come up to the mic, but you have to be on that side. Um, let me go to diplomacy. You know, last weekend, the U.S. Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, your counterpart, he said that the Biden administration has very real concerns that China is contemplating providing material support to Russia's war effort in Ukraine. During the Munich Security Conference, I believe that you met with uh, Wang Yi. Um, do you share the same perspective uh, on um, the U.S. concern? Uh, I haven't seen, I heard what Secretary was saying. And uh, of course, we are. Uh, alarmed with this perspective. Uh, we haven't seen specific facts at this point. Um, I had a meeting with, but we live in a world where nothing can be excluded. And again, when the, when the future of your country is at stake, you become extremely cautious. When I met with Councillor Van Yi, we had a long conversation, um, mainly about, he, he shared with me key elements of this peace proposal that uh, China is going to put forward within days, I think. Uh, but we also spoke about the principle of territorial integrity. And uh, this is the cornerstone of both foreign policy of China and Ukraine and many other countries of the world, of course. And I... Uh, I think that if China, and I say if because I don't have facts in my hands, but if China decides to support milita you know, Russia militarily, uh, it will may be a major blow against its own policy. It's a, against its own cornerstone principle, principle of territorial integrity. Because assisting Russia in, viola in violating territorial integrity of Ukraine, you know, it doesn't require any additional explanation. China is a big and important player. We have to be careful. But, uh, you know, we made our choice. We will fight until we prevail. Whatever happens and whoever tries to support Russia in this struggle. So let's see how how it evolves, but we remain, uh, we will remain co in close contact with both uh, Chinese and uh, Chinese colleagues and uh, American friends. Thank you for that. And by the way, if I may just restate again, the reason why you have to come up to the podium is because the camera's there and you'll be facing him at the back of the room. So please, for those who'd like to ask questions to come around to the side, Eric, back to you. Um, thank you, Minister. When you do win, which I hope is very soon, and you want to write that book, make sure you call us at the Belfer Center first. It's a nice place to write the book, and I'd be happy to learn more about that too. Um, I, I have a question about what you're working on today, and of course, it's me, so it's a follow-up question. Um, today, like you mentioned, you're at the UN General Assembly, and you're pushing hard um, at the UN there to, to protest the violations of Russian um, war crimes, I think is the way I would say it. This ties to my last question in that you've said publicly before that um, no peace process could start until there's a tribunal on Russian war crimes that is initiated was the first precondition. The second is that it should be the UN and the UN secretary general that oversaw a peace process. My question is this, when, I'll be optimistic, we get to the point that you have achieved strategic advantage on the battlefield and it's time for a peace process. Would you really hold up a peace process on a UN war crimes tribunal for Russia and the secretary general doing it? Or would you soften your stand to let the tribunal come later and have someone like Erdogan, for example, run the peace process? 
Did I say that about the tribunal and the secretary general? You did. Yeah, I got it. It's right here in AP article from December. Oh, oh, uh, <laughs> I know. I know. I have to double check. I'm in front of my students. I have to practice what I preach in case I get asked a question by the foreign minister. No. Okay. Um, uh, whatever it's, whatever this AP report says, uh, my, my posi our position is the following. The establishment of the tribunal is not a prerequisite for the beginning of any diplomatic effort. Um, in fact, I see victory or the end of this war in two phases. The first one is what I call, you know, short victory. This is, uh, this requires one thing. Russia's withdrawal from the territory of Ukraine, which is restoring Ukraine's territorial integrity uh, within its internationally recognized borders as of 1991. This will be the day when I take out a bottle of champagne, uncork it, and finish it. This, is, this will be the victory day for me. But then will be the long victory process. And I remember one of the U.S. lawyers uh, called everything that happened between the 8th of May, 1945, and the day when Nuremberg Tribunal delivered its last judgment, he called it the second phase of the war, right? And for me, this I call it the long-term peace. So after we win and liberate our territory, there will be issues about Russia's paying compensations. Russian officials being brought to trial for the crime of aggression. Uh, Russian soldiers and officers brought to trial for war crimes, crimes against humanity and other atrocities committed. And many, many other things will follow until the set, the final kind of, we will turn the last page of this, of this conflict. But no, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that, uh, having the tribunal is a prerequisite for, for the settlement. It will take years because it's international justice and it has to be conducted in accordance with the rule of law. Uh, tribunal is not an easy thing to achieve for a number of reasons. But, you know, I get, how to put it in a diplomatic way, I get upset when I hear <laughs> that, uh, that um, Ukraine uh, to set up a tribunal to try Russian leadership for the crime of aggression. We have to follow existing precedents. And since uh, UN Security Council won't be able to establish this tribunal, therefore, um, we have to seek, uh, therefore, it will be difficult to achieve, achieve that goal. Guys, we are literally living in the middle of history in the making. And if our predecessors were making bold decisions because they wanted to pursue justice and these decisions were unprecedented for their time, now is the perfect time to make new unprecedented decisions. If our goal is peace and justice, peace cannot be uh, achieved in full if we fall if within existing structures and procedures. This is, this is the thing. It will require time, but we will, we will get there. And um, you mentioned facilitators, mediators. Many tried in the last 12 months. Very, very few achieved. But I think, uh, but I'm no... Last, last September, I was in New York, and one foreign minister approached me and said, we have a peace plan. We will announce it within a couple of days. We want to take the lead. And I told him, sit down. <laughs> we, had, we, we, have, we had a conversation like for 15 minutes. He stood up, shook my hand, and he said, okay, probably it's not the best time to put forward the peace. <laughs> so we welcome all peace initiatives. But uh, in most of the cases, it's just, you know, a smokescreen for domestic purpose, policy purposes and an excuse not to do something to support Ukraine. Because you come up with a peace plan and you say, Ukraine, I cannot do anything for you because I have a peace plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's, what, that's how it was in the last 12 months.
Minister, I, I know you're, we're getting close to the time when uh, we have to end our session. We have a number of students, uh, and I'm going to try to get them in, all of them. There are just four uh, standing up, but I was going to take two. Uh, could the two of you please come up to the podium? We're going to take both of your questions, and then we'll take the other two. So if you'll come up, please, and introduce yourself and ask your question, and then she'll introduce herself. The young lady has on her T-shirt, Slava Ukraina, by the way. But all right. I don't Slava. <laughs> Please. Hello, Mr. Uh, Minister Kuleba. Look uh, at the camera th there. Thank you for uh, being here with us today. Uh, my name is Orhan Hasanov. I'm from Azerbaijan. And as someone who recently experienced war, I understand your feeling. And I wish uh, all the best for the Ukrainian nation. Uh, um, so my question is, you mentioned uh, the strategic mistakes that were that happened during the time span between 91 and 93. So I wanted to know your perspective on what else was done, had been done wrong that made Russia think that they can get away with it easily. And what do you think can be done in the future to prevent this kind of things happening with other nations and other countries? Thank you. Minister, if you took that on board, may I ask the other the young lady to come up, introduce herself to ask her question. So as I said, we can get the students in, please. Доброго дня, пане міністре. My name is Svetlana. I'm a second year student at Harvard Business School from Ukraine. And I cannot help but thank Minister Kuleba for everything he does. The first time I was in the U.S. in 2013, Viktor Yanukovych was still a president. And the only feeling I had toward like public leadership of my country was shame and frustration. Right now, I feel extremely proud of you being here talking to Harvard. And this feeling is priceless. And this is like my like last question for the session. I want to make it not political. Mr. Kaleba, you joke that you're old. I actually want to say that it's not true. You're the youngest Minister of Foreign Affairs in Ukraine's history. And in one of your interviews, you mentioned that the phrase that was following you all your career was, he is great, but he's too young for the job. Here at Harvard, we do not have a shortage of young and ambitious people. So what would be your advice to these people to get that job sooner than later? Thank you. <laughs> Minister. Well, my, my assistant just uh, showed me that uh, we, we have time. So if you have, if, if it was, if on your side, it was not a, del a, a diplomatic way of saying you, you want to wrap up, we can take the other. <laughs> okay. All right. Trust <laughs> me, there's nothing urgent at Harvard. <laughs> Well, well, thank you. Uh, but uh, if you want to take these two questions, and then, as I said, we have two more in the queue. But please, what was your, uh, uh, on the tips for students who want to advance at a younger age? Listen, <laughs> you know, you know, all this, all this uh, ratings, like the best, uh, the best uh, before. Uh, what is that thing? Huh? Yeah, like 30 under 30 or <laughs> 10, under, 10, 10 under 35. Did you notice that all of these ratings never go beyond 40? <laughs> so, you know, I never, I never made it to any top, top listings and <laughs> before I got turned 40. So that's why I'm saying I'm not young anymore. There is no list that I can apply for to be on top. <laughs> on the list of top, top, top in something. I'm, I'm old. I'm not 30. I'm not 35. That's it's gone. No top list, <laughs> no ratings for me. The rest is a decline. Um, <laughs> listen, and the other clip, oh, be, my, 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 my advice to everyone, just love what you're doing. You have to love, you, you have to be in love with your job, with your occupation, with your daily routine. And uh, I always, I always, and my second advice would be always have second profession so that you do not become a slave of your first profession. <laughs> I always knew that uh, I will be, uh, that I have other skills which will help me to make, to make uh, uh, some, to make uh, money for living. And uh, it allows you to say no in the critical situations because you, you are not enslaved by the system. You are a free person who has, who has a right to choose. 
And when I was a young diplomat, like very young diplomat, I, uh, a very, very wise man once told me that if I want to become a boss one day, I have to learn how to say no to people. And it was, it proved to be one of the most helpful advices I ever got. In the critical situations, you need to have stamina to say no. Uh, but you also have to know how to say yes. If that answers your question, of course. Right? That was. Yes, I think that. And on the first question. Yes, on the first question, uh, the easiest, the easiest thing, of course, is to blame everyone for making mistakes. And it sells on social media and sometimes even uh, during lectures at Harvard. But life, of course, is more, is more complicated, right? And uh, these mistakes were not made because countries or officials or people were necessarily intending to make these mistakes. They were just misreading reality, misreading uh, uh, what history was telling them. And this is why I started my introduction, my remarks with uh, the chicken Kiev speech. The whole system, and Paula, you must, you must remember these times, right? The whole system of the United States did not read how the situation would evolve. You know that while George Bush was in Kiev, he even declined the uh, plea to meet with Ukrainian politicians uh, striving for independence because he didn't want to upset his friend Mikhail Gorbachev or the Gorby. You know, I don't think George Bush was looking for an opportunity to make a mistake. Sometimes we just misread reality and how to read reality is one of the most important skills. The same goes for the second case that I, that I brought up, Russia's uh, appearance at the UN Security Council. I argue and both the law, the, and the law is on my side that Russia's presence on the United Nations Security Council is illegitimate. Russia has no right to be there. But everyone turned a blind eye on that in 1991 because it was unimaginable to imagine UN Security Council without Russia. And Soviet Union and Russia were equalized while it was not the case. Ukraine was a founding member of uh, the United Nations together with the Soviet Union. So formally, we could have claimed the seat in the UN Security Council and the veto right. And I assure you, the world would have been different if it was <laughs> not the direction there. So I think the biggest mistake, and, uh, and going back to, to, uh, to Azerbaijan and the Caucasus in, in, in general, I think the, the biggest mistake that um, the West made towards, Ru towards Russia, and also we did the same mistake, we could, we could never imagine life without them, one way or another. And this is why Russia was allowed to dominate in, in Caucasus, and, uh, this, uh, and you, know the rest, you know the rest of the story. Minister, may I ask you, we have two more students. Is it feasible to take the two other questions together? Yes, and then I go. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so please come up, gentlemen. Let's take each of you. Please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you very much. The camera's there. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Uh, and, uh, please allow me to uh, wearing a mask because you know, I'm, I'm a thirst world. I'm sorry. And so uh, my name is Ken Junior from Japan. I'm a Japanese diplomat studying in Harvard Kennedy School. And uh, I really want to ask you your candid and frank opinion about recent, ja uh, you know, Japanese, you know, diplomatic posture uh, against uh, toward Ukraine. So J I know that Japan is the only G7 country uh, where neither uh, prime minister or president nor uh, foreign minister visited Ukraine. And so under such kind of, kind of circumstance, uh, Japan had to have to uh, the uh, held the hold G7 meeting in this coming May. So what you what you ask, uh, what what do you want? What do you want Japan to, um, what do you want Japan to uh to do for Ukraine or what 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 do you hope uh for for Japan to support Ukraine right now? 
Very clear. And please, if you'll come and introduce yourself. Shalom, uh, Bala Minisar. It's really good to have you here today. It's a pleasure to see you, even with virtually. Um, at the beginning of, uh, actually, maybe I should introduce myself first, but my name is Lan Lei. So I'm an MPP1 student here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Master's of Public Policy. Right? Master, yeah, <laughs> which is Master's of Public Policy. And my question for you is this. At the beginning of the call, you know, you mentioned the challenge of having to still, even after one year of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, having to still convince countries to, you know, believe in the Ukrainian cause, specifically within the global south. How do you think Ukraine can best rally support in the global south for the Ukrainian cause? Two very good, very clear questions and precise. Minister. Well, um, don't expect a candid answer from a foreign minister <laughs> about the position of uh, a country that is presiding in the G7 <laughs> while his country is at war and requires G7 support. So uh, I have excellent relations with my Japanese colleague. Uh, it is regrettable that the prime minister of Japan has not visited Ukraine yet, but we are working on that visit and we see that uh, uh, Japanese colleagues are serious about making it happen. Uh, I think Japan, Jap Japan's latest announcement of the support they have uh, kind of uh, secured in their budget for Ukraine is, is very important. And uh, I don't think that, I, I'm not concerned that uh, the support that Japan is offering to Ukraine will slow down. I mean, as G7 presidency, they uh, will they will continue to do to do their utmost to to uh, to help Ukraine with uh, with what we need. I regret though that your constitution does not allow transfer of weapons. Uh, Japan has a lot of stuff that we need, and if your constitution allowed it, we would have gotten uh, some necessary stuff. Uh, on the second question, listen, Global South is, let me put it this way, Global South requires a serious and, uh, uh, mm -hmm. cold-headed, is there such a cold-headed cold -headed and cold-headed analysis. First, there is no such thing as a unified position of the Global South. If you remember the Cold War days, there was the movement of non-alignment. Yes, they had unified position. Global South is not unified. Look back at the resolution passed in October 19, in October, last October, which secured 143 votes. Many, many Global South countries voted for in favor. So positions of countries of the Global South are nuanced. And every country deserves uh, special special attention. Second, positions of the global South countries are uh, shifting. They are dynamic. Very few countries are rock solid in their positions. They are dynamic, and we are working with them. And third, um, I think that um, Ukraine, the the Russian aggression against Ukraine, brought global South back on the in the big political in the big game of world diplomacy because before that global south was mostly about you know providing assistance and fighting for resources but now look everyone is fighting for the sympathy of countries belonging to global south uh, uh, visits uh, talks uh, persuasion everything everything is thrown into the battle so we should not we should neither overestimate nor underestimate the importance of the uh, countries of the global south in this struggle. The coalitions have been formed and they will remain as they are more or less until uh, one of the sides, and uh, it will be Ukraine, begins to prevail on the battlefield. The more successful we will be on the battlefield, the more 
certain countries will be drifting in the right, in the right direction. It's easy. Uh, like in life, in diplomacy, it's the same. People like to be on the winning side. They, they love siding. They love siding with the winner. And uh, many countries of the global side are still waiting to see who will be prevailing to, be, to, be, to take a more open stance. Minister Kaleba, we come at the end of our session. And let me just say your time that you have taken with every question, I mean, in really being very clear about Ukraine's position, we're just very gratified to have you here virtually. And the fact that you took your time uh, today to do this in the midst of what's taking place at the United Nations, we're most appreciative. So no. Eric, myself, and all those not only here in the room, but that's also online, uh, just again, are very grateful uh, for your uh, presence. And let me just close by saying again, Slava Ukraina to you. Dear, Slava. dear Eric, dear Paula, dear students, I really appreciate this opportunity. You cannot imagine Please. how much I wanted to come to see you in person and just to change the environment, you know, and to be in the university world <laughs> instead of instead of uh, the walls of the offices in the United Nations where I spend most of my, my time. But I'm sure the day will come and I will make it if you decide to invite me again. And uh, I will be looking forward to seeing you in Ukraine too. So thank you very much. Stay safe. And Thank you, Mr. Minister. You're you. always welcome. You let us know and we'll make it happen. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you again.